Back in November of 2018, as the price of Bitcoin was crashing relative to the US dollar, I wrote a tweet. And I said, if you want the price to go back up, get back to asking the question, what is Bitcoin? If you want the price to keep dropping, keep acting like you know the answer. And what I meant by that was, in order for the price of Bitcoin to go up relative to the dollar, people have to believe that Bitcoin is valuable relative to the dollar. And since value is subjective, that's going to mean that a whole lot of people are going to have to understand and realize what makes Bitcoin valuable to them. But you can't even begin to understand what makes Bitcoin valuable to you until you really understand what is Bitcoin. And of course, you can't understand that unless you ask the question. And so I've asked the question, and I constantly ask the question. I'm asking it every day. I'm asking, what is Bitcoin? Trying to understand it better. And one of the answers that keeps coming back to me is something that I wanted to share with you now. What keeps coming back to me is Bitcoin is a tool for individual financial sovereignty. It's a phrase that we do hear in the space, but I don't think that we hear it enough. And one of the reasons why is I think most people don't really have a good idea of what that means and how central the idea of personal sovereignty is to our culture. It goes back to its very roots. And so let's go back to the roots and then we'll move forward and understand how Bitcoin fits in. The idea of individual sovereignty is absolutely core in the West. And if we wanted to trace the ideas that underlie Bitcoin, the very kernel of the ideas back, I think the earliest place that we could trace it back in our culture is one of the most famous stories from the New Testament, from the Gospels. And this is actually from the book of Mark. It's about one of the manifestations of what Jesus called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's an idea about sovereignty. This is from the King James Version. In this story, they are trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to catch him up in something so that he can be imprisoned by the Roman authorities. And this is about taxes and should they pay taxes. It's a famous story, best known as Render Unto Caesar. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt you me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. It's an interesting story where here you have this central figure of all of Western culture, and there's no, no doubting that Christianity is uh, at the core in terms of the ideology of Western culture. Here's the central figure who, like many Bitcoiners, is saying that fiat leaves much to be desired, saying that that money which is issued by the state is not of value to him, and that there's another opportunity and another form of currency, another medium of exchange that can be used, that is God's, he says. The things that are God's. And it's interesting because this actually echoes, and myself being American and, and coming now as I'm recording this only a week away from Independence Day, so much of this idea continues through and we start to see what the vein is that leads us to Bitcoin. So in 1384, John Wycliffe wrote in a prologue to his translation of the Bible, the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That'll sound familiar to students of American history. And then during World War II, Pope Pius XII, quoting 
this passage from the New Testament said, Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. One would like to add, Give unto man things which are man's. Give man his freedom and personality, his rights and religion. So here is the bishop of Rome, the person who's supposed to be Christ's representative on earth. That's the idea of the Pope echoing the First Amendment of the Constitution, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. Of course, coming from out of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And of course, consent and consensus have the same Latin root word, consentire, which means to allow or really literally to feel together. So they're talking about the idea that governments are there to protect these things which are gods, these God-given rights. Uh, these things which need to not be rendered up to Caesar, that instead it's Caesar's job to protect the sovereignty of the individual. Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address went back to Wycliffe's statement, but instead of uh, Wycliffe saying that the Bible is for the government of the people, Lincoln admonishes the crowd towards the end in the famous statement that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So that is to say that there's this idea that goes through Western culture and is expressed at its height in the American experience, that those things which are God's, those things which are to be rendered unto God and not to the government, is the sovereignty of the individual, are the rights that an individual has to be free, to pursue his happiness, to have life, to be able to express himself, not be censored, to be able to practice his religion. Of course, religion, the root word, the Latin root word, which forms religion, which really means to bind together. So to be able to have human relationships with one another and that ability to have that relationship outside of the state with another person, to be able to render unto God that which is God's is expressed all these millennia and centuries later in Bitcoin. It's what makes it so disruptive. It's right there in the title of the white paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer cash system. Cash, people in the space argue about what this word cash means. What's a good way to define cash? I think that it's fine if we say that it means settlement finality. The idea that once an exchange is done, it's final. Peer-to-peer. Me to you, person to person, bound together, that in our pursuing of happiness, that we have the freedom to exchange with one another, to render unto God that which is God's, or to be able to have a money that is God's money, so to speak, not in a religious way, but in the way of this philosophical idea of being of the people, by the people, for the people, outside of the idea of the state. And this is said by Satoshi Nakamoto right in the introduction to the white paper, where he says, what is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need for a trusted third party. Who are those trusted third parties? Maybe we could just call them third parties because the trust is, eh. He's obviously talking about financial institutions, banks, and the government. He's making a statement about rendering unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, 
rendering unto each other that which is ours, rendering unto God that which is God's, our own sovereignty. So I keep saying sovereignty. What does sovereign mean? So it comes from the Latin root of super, which is over. So you've got sover and then reign. It's that reign. So it really means reign over. To reign over the final authority, the final judge. In the case of Jesus, he was talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He's referred to as the king of kings. The idea of the final authority, the final judgment, who will sit in judgment, who will be the final arbiter. In the fiat system, the final arbiter are the banks who can just decide to take your money. And really the government that is in the unholy alliance with the banks, the state, that that's the final judge. In Bitcoin, the final judge is cryptographic proof. The final judge are the laws of nature and mathematics that, if you believe in God, were put there by God. And even if you don't believe in God, are aspects of nature. And so, previously, you had the idea of the sovereign, and the sovereign was the state. The sovereign was Caesar. If you were to go and you were to hunt on the king's lands, you could be killed for that. There were ideas that to commit certain crimes were crimes against the state. In the drug war, you had the idea that to possess and consume certain plants, to put something into your own body, was a crime against the sovereign, against the state. That's why if you were caught and brought to trial, it would be the state of X versus you. You had committed a crime against the sovereign because, presumably, the sovereign must be the ruler of your body. The same goes for the idea of the income tax. This is something that I write about in my book, Self-Ownership. If your employer doesn't just pay you because they don't, in most of the West, most modern countries, if there's an income tax, your employer pays you and then also pays your sovereign, the government. And if for some reason enough has not been paid of your income, what are you told? You are told that you owe, you owe the government for your labor. Just the same way as if you and I both own a house jointly and I sell the house and I don't give you your proper percentage, the percent of equity that you have, I owe you that the profit or the fruits of that exchange. So this is the sovereign saying, this is the person who is over you saying, you do not have full sovereignty of your labor, which means that you do not have full sovereignty of your mind, of your body. So you must render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's because you are Caesar's. And this is what Bitcoin allows to be disrupted. This is why Bitcoin is valuable. This is the big reason. It's because it fulfills a promise. It fulfills a promise of our ever-evolving understanding of individual rights and of freedom. It fulfills a promise that goes back millennia. The idea that you would render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and that's fine so long as you're participating in that system, but it offers you a system that is of the people, by the people, and for the people, that you're protected by cryptographic proof, that you are protected by nature, by the rules put there, by whoever created the rules or whatever created the rules. Whatever that is, that is who you render unto. And you are going to have to render unto that creature or force or whatever it is. If you want to get your Bitcoins, you're certainly going to have to solve and cryptographically prove. But so long as you can do that, so long as you can render unto God that which is God's, that mathematical proof, then you can participate in the system. P.
peer-to-peer cash is about sovereignty, personal, individual sovereignty. You are next to God, and everyone is at the top of their own personal hierarchy. There's only math above you, and none of us can escape that. None of us can escape the rules of nature. And it's a fantastic opportunity because we're able to take back bodily autonomy. It's valuable because human beings are able to take back from themselves to be kings of their own world. And of course, your finances mean so much of that because they're the fruits of your labor. And your labor comes from your body and your mind, those things which are yours. And it's sovereignty in the exchange of the fruits of that labor between individuals all over the world at instantaneous speed. That's why it's valuable. And it becomes less and less and less valuable the more of Caesar that is brought into it because it destroys the promise. It's rendering unto Caesar something which is not Caesar's. And every time, whether it was in the words of Jesus, whether it was in the words of the founding fathers, at every step of the way, this idea has been at the root of increasing the personal freedom of human beings. This idea has been at the root of taking people out of bondage, decreasing their suffering. This is at the root of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is a real tool. And this is why it's valuable. And this is why it's more valuable than that which is Caesar's. And it always has been more valuable than that which is Caesar's. And to understand that, and to understand why it is more valuable, is exactly how we will see over time that it will be expressed, no doubt, in price. But most importantly, it will be expressed in a measure of human freedom.